All right, folks, I'm gonna get started here as people uh, finish signing on. Um, so hello, welcome to our third Lunch and Learn of the season. I'm Allison Marcioni. I'm the Programs Director at the Upper Valley Land Trust, and I wanna thank you for attending today. I think we have a really interesting presentation for you. Um, before we get started, I do wanna let everyone know that this presentation is being recorded and will be available on the UVLT YouTube channel after uh, it's over. So I'm excited to welcome to you to our discussion about the Abenaki Land Link Project. Uh, today we have Chief Don Stevens of the Nalhegan Band of the Acoustic Abenaki Nation, Zia Luce, the Events and Engagement Coordinator at NOFA Vermont, and myself, Allison Marcioni, the Programs Director at UVLT. Um, Don Stevens, Chief of the Nalhegan Band of the Acoustic Abenaki Nation and Executive Director of the Tribal Nonprofit AHA Abenaki Helping Abenaki Inc. Don is a leader, businessman, writer, and lecturer. He's been featured in magazines, books, media, TV shows, and documentaries involving his work with the Abenaki community. Don was appointed to the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs by Governor Douglas in 2006 for two terms, where he served as chair in his second term. Don helped lead the fight to obtain legal recognition for the Abenaki people in Vermont who were recognized by the Vermont legislature in 2011. Don was able to acquire land and hunting and fishing rights for the Nalhegan tribe, which has been absent for over 200 years. Don continues to work with the federal government, legislators, state and local governments, institutions and other Indian nations to represent Nalhegan Abenaki viewpoints. Don has over 30 years of experience in successfully developing information, technology, logistics and strategies for multi-million dollar companies. He proudly served in the US Army and graduated from Champlain College with a degree in computer information systems. Don currently serves on many state boards and advisory panels. Don was recently honored by Middlebury College, Champlain College, and Sterling College with doctorates of human letters degrees. Don is married to his lovely wife, Diane Stevens, who is a physical therapist at the UVM Medical Center. They have six children and eight grandchildren. Zia is the events and engagement coordinator at the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont. She considers herself a community builder and steward of the earth. She grew up on a farm and her background includes zero waste work and local food systems. She has coordinated farm to school and buy fresh by local programs managed an educational farm, a master composter program, and more. Prior to NOFA, she managed various programs and events for the Vermont Fresh Network and Dig in VT, and has a degree in environmental studies and completed an agroecology and sustainable food systems program. Zia currently serves on the board of her local food cooperative and lives in an eco village. And our final presenter is me. I'm Allison Marcioni. As I said, I'm the programs director at the Upper Valley Land Trust. I've been the programs director for almost five years. And before that, I was a land steward for two years. In addition to many other hats, I created and run our food pantry garden program, which is what I will be talking about in this presentation. So just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, I am going to ask everyone to stay on mute for the presentation so we don't have any disruptive noises or feedback. Um, and if you have questions, which I really hope that you will, um, please type them into the chat box. And when the presentation is over, I will go through the questions and ask them to the panel. So with all of that information, let's get started. I'm gonna turn this over to Zia. Hi, everyone. Um, so Chief Don, I'll share my slides if you wanna take it away and give some background here. Sure. Koi Koi Ni Hello, friends. Um, I'm Chief Don Stevens of the Nulhegan tribe, as uh, Allison had mentioned. Uh, just to kind of give you a little historical background, um, as you know, when Europeans came, they, wouldn't, they weren't able to survive the winter because they weren't used to our climate growing. So Native people helped them survive the winters. Um, so part of this project is how do we how do we ask Europeans to also help us grow uh, foods when all of our land, we were displaced from our land and we didn't have access to our land anymore. So part of this process was uh, kind of a three-legged uh, brainchild uh, of mine. It was to provide natural access, or I should say access to natural foods, medicines, artist materials, uh, to get, you know, to get access to our, the, the, the things that our ancestors once had, even though we didn't have land. So part of that structure of our food security or food sovereignty programs was to work with different um, places like different land trusts and other people to, um, to access land. The second 
<clears throat> the second part of that was to create a garden program to help feed our people because we have a huge health disparities uh, uh, as a minority population and we don't have access to healthy foods. And because we have a hard time growing food because we have no tribal community land, that's where the brainchild was to work originally uh, with, with colleges and then move into uh, both commercial and local farmers to help us grow food. And the third leg of that stool was meat production. We have a herd of bison uh, in Shoreham. We raise 24 heads of bison and we cull them once a year, some of them to feed our people, including um, uh, beef and other types of meat um, products. And along with this, we've opened three food distribution areas. We have a food shelf in Holland, Vermont, uh, which is out of the old Holland School. Uh, and we rent the school and, and distribute to the community of Holland, Orleans, uh, and other areas uh, locally up there. We have uh, our place in Shelburne that I help distrib distribute food out of the local uh, area of people, our citizens in that area, and Contacook, New Hampshire, where we have a, another distribution food site for our New Hampshire citizens and our Massachusetts and Southern Vermont. So that's kind of a big uh, overview of kind of the food program as in, you know, kind of what we're doing now. So we started this project back in 2012 after we received our recognition in 2011. We started on our, our forest land up in Barton. We have 68 acres of forest land and we wanted to prove the concept that we could grow food inside a forest without um, plowing up a bunch of areas. And surprisingly enough, we could. You know, as long as it could get water and sunlight, we could make mounds within between trees, you know, and open brush areas where we could actually grow food uh, without having to uh, have to plow up an entire area, which was kind of significant in the fact of that's how our ancestors would have done it as well, was create these areas, pockets of, of food any way that they could. So we were able to prove that, but it's, there's, you can't do it on a scale in a tribal force that would support a community of 1500 citizens or more. So we started working originally back in 2015 or so after we um, applied to this on our tribal land with Sterling College. We approached them to ask them to grow our foods to be a seed bank because part of this work was to gain back our ancient seeds. So the Seeds of Renewal project that was developed uh, by Fred Wiseman was, was his his mission was to go out and recapture our old ancient seeds like Kosa corn, Algonquin squash, Montpelier squash, um, you know, things that were indigenous to us in Vermont and the things that we grew here that was conducive to our, to our people. So he was able to go out and acquire these, these seeds from different, either the tribes or from other locations to be able to create this small seed bank, but we had to grow them out because we had a finite amount. So we started working with Sterling College to help grow out our, our seeds <clears throat> and they would become a seed bank for us. And then those crops could be then distributed to the, 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 the college students, but also our people to then eat. And then we would educate them about that. Um, that was so successful that the following year I went to Middlebury College and started uh, working with them to open up a, a growing at the Knoll and doing the same thing. And then the, the, the year after working with them, um, uh, UVM Horticultural Farm and the UVM Extension Service. Uh, and then that's, that's when NOFA uh, came on board uh, and they decided they would love to help us. We started with 15 growers uh, with NOFA, uh, which included, like I said, commercial and individual farmers to help grow our foods. And, and NOFA was gracious enough to coordinate all of that for us and work with us to distribute the seeds, keep track of what's going on with the growers and, and then also manage the uh, celebration, harvest celebration that we would have at the end of the year and also the, the collecting of the, the produce and then um, processing them and then distributing them to our, to our citizens. And over the last year, um, that grew last year to 40 growers from 15 to 40. Uh, and part of that was wonderful. I mean, I think we did 3,600 pounds of squash and we processed around 700 or 1,000 pounds of squash. This is a picture 
um, at the uh, Joe Boston's, uh, the Vermont Bean Company. He's a wonderful partner of ours. He helps provide places to process the foods uh, and also help package. We have a lot of volunteers, including a lot of growers that helped us uh, process these squash and beans. And we got together in the fall and had this huge, huge processing days. We've had like over a couple of weekends where we would all get together and process the foods and package and distribute. Um, you know, there's some lessons learned that we had and and there were some fun times. We cooked our own, our, our, our cornmeal <laughs> recipes and uh, thrashed some beans. And it, it was a beautiful way to have the community come together and actually just provide healthy foods for people who couldn't provide that for themselves. Uh, it was a great partnership doing that. And we continue to do that every year. Um, and then NOFA put together uh, the Harvest Festival that we had with the VYCC. So I don't know if you wanna go to the next slide, if there's one. Um, so this is an example of our Algonquin squash. Great thing about Algonquin squash, especially the one in the middle that's really orange, uh, well, to the left from the middle, it's kind of oblong. Um, it is a, a very um, prolific squash. You can eat it green and you can also eat it um, orange. The more orangey it gets, the more sugar it has and the and the more flavor it has um, but you could eat it almost like a zucchini type squash when it's green or in this manner when it's orange and the long but the longer you let it dry it turns woody and stringy a little bit but it's a very it, it holds sometimes even into january we when we had some of our processing days it was in january when we is when we were processing some of this and they were still viable um, so they, they'll store for a long time so I'm not sure if you wanna uh, jump in or I can continue, uh, Zia. Uh, these are skunk beans. These are one of our indigenous beans. Uh, some pe the only thing closest I know to it is the orca bean. But uh, the skunk bean, there's a historical context of, uh, we would take beans like the skunk beans and we would string them on a necklace. And our warriors who would go out and hunt would normally go anywhere between three days to a week out from the village to hunt. And if they were unsuccessful at getting game, they could break their necklace and create a bean soup that would carry them for another couple of days to get back to the village. There are many historical examples of uh, beans that were strung on, on the neck. Uh, and we have some at the Burlington International Airport on the second floor that people can see. And um, uh, when the French saw this, they decided to make trade beads that looked like skunk beans. So when we became more domesticated and had more farming and more strategic locations where we didn't need to um, go out and, and, and hunt as far away as we did before, they started, uh, we started replacing the skunk beans with these ornamental beads that look like skunk beans. Um, because that's, that was more durable. As you can probably imagine, you can't wear beans around your neck for very long and then stay viable uh, because they are a living organism. Uh, in the middle is a true cranberry bean. That is another Vermont indigenous bean. It's sort of like a kidney bean. It, it's very delicious, very good. Both of these are pole beans. They're very, they're, they grow really well and they pr produce a, a lot of beans. I believe on the right is Mohawk, uh, a type of Mohawk bean. Uh, it is more like a baked kind of, you know, baked bean. We used to call, we used to cook things in things called bean holes. We would dig a hole, put some coals and bury it and then cook it in the more modern time when we had metal pots, of course. Um, so these, these beans are pole beans and they grow really well and they provide a, a lot of, uh, a lot of substance. Yeah, I know you mentioned the corn already, but I do have the next slide mm -hmm. is the corn. So these are the primary crops that growers have been growing for the project, the Algonquin squash, these three beans, and oh, I don't have the corn yep. next. <laughs> um, and just to mention too, that the Coasa corn is our, it's really highly packed in, in oil. It's probably about four inches long. It grows about four feet high. It's got about a 60 to 65 day uh, mature time or, um, and, it, and you could almost do two crops of it in one year if you were able to get it in the ground or stagger that that crops and it's a flint corn but it's kind of hard to grind grind because it does have a lot of oil 
Um, we also have things called Abenaki rose corn, which is a white corn with a, a red uh, center uh, or a, a dent, uh, and it's called Abenaki rose. You can buy that commercially. We have a lot of, we usually stick with our callus flint corns, which are uh, either red or yellow, and you can buy some of those commercially. That's what we make our cornmeal out of. But there's also, if you get into lower than the Koa suck, there's the Gaspé corn, which is uh, the, the most furthest northern growing corn there is. It's probably about two feet high and it grows sideways. So it's almost like a weed and two very small, probably two inch uh, cobs. As you can imagine, it would take a lot of corn uh, a lot of plants to, to get a volume. But I'm just saying is that we have everything from gas bay corn that we can grow to Coasa corn to the flint corns, which are the, the large, I think the callus uh, flint corns are like a foot long uh, or could get up to that. And that's what we would use. And we would store those after we dried them obviously in, in, um, in jars like clay jars and keep them. And we would store all this food in a location where you grew. Most people thought that you brought it with you. That's a misconception. A lot of times we would grow our foods around the floodplains and we would find storage areas around that area. And we would, at the end of the year, part of the harvest festival was to share our bounty. Like we had too much corn, so we had too much squash, we would trade and do all that. But we would store them in our summering grounds. And then as we needed them, from our winter grounds, we would go back to those storage caches and grab them and bring them back to our village to then use. That's part of why when the Europeans used to come across these, these, these storage areas, they would either destroy them so we would starve to death or they would take them and use them for themselves. And that's because they weren't really guarded, right? I mean, they were, they were kind of hidden, buried or whatever. And then when we would go back to get them and then if they were gone, then we, would, we wouldn't have that food throughout the winter and we would starve or, or like I said, Europeans would take it and use it for themselves. So I just wanted to at least let people know that we didn't carry all of these crops with us wherever we went. We, we would cash them and then we would go back and send a party to go get what we needed periodically throughout the year or out the winter until we moved back. Great. So yeah, I just wanted to do a quick shout out for some of the growers that we had this year. Um, they ranged from small gardens, school gardens, homesteaders growing on a slightly bigger scale to commercial growers and certainly um, several land trusts as well, like the Upper Valley Land Trust. Um, and as Chief Don said, it helped coordinate the harvest and the drop off. So people were growing all over the state as you saw on the map. And we had some drop off days where they were bringing their mature crops so the squash as most, yeah as most farmers would know i mean you would even probably say this too uh zia that last year was a, a uncanny growing season for squash i mean some of these squash were huge like 20 like i don't know i might be exaggerating but they felt like they were 20 pounds some of them yes. i mean they were huge uh that's why we had so much of uh success because the water uh, man, they exploded and we had more squash than I think we knew what to do with. And, uh, but, and also just to kind of go back to, we really value our partners and the kids getting involved. Like the, we, we value like the VYCC who allows us to have places to store this stuff and process and same with the bean company and all the growers. But part of this was also educating about who we are. Because people are usually are afraid of people, the things they don't know or understand. And I think the native people have a lot of value to provide in our stories, like our corn mother stories and, you know, our, our three sisters garden. I mean, there's actually seven sisters, but we tell the three sisters story and how corn and tobacco came to us. And then how the squash and the, and the beans became part of that in the mound systems. And, you know, what are the misconceptions? What aren't? So I think there's a lot of value in us educating the growers who help us and others about our food systems. And um, so it's a win-win on, on many levels. Absolutely. Um, and then we had folks growing for us that, growing for the project, um, that were integrating education beyond just their own learning. Um, 
so this is one of our growers here, Common Roots, Joanne Dene, um, really integrated it into the curriculum for what was happening on their site. Yeah, I also want to throw in too that this thing has been a wonderful partnership in the fact that not only did we start out growing our indigenous crops, but we're now starting, a lot of farmers are saying, hey, I have extra potatoes, could you use those? Hey, I have extra carrots uh, that I don't need, could you use those to feed your people? And, uh, or working with the, you know, the horticultural farm at BYCC and saying, hey, we have, a, we have a CSA share that we'd love to provide for you over the summer. So that way you, because our people are hungry all year round, not just during the winter when these, most of what we're growing are winter crops, right? They're, they're to cover you through the winter months. Um, but people, you know, who can't grow gardens or have a limited space or time or, or can't, you know, some we've morphed into the CSA programs and working with our partners who started doing with the SNOFA project of just our winter crops. It has now morphed into uh, a more food secure area. So I'm very proud of all of our growers. I'm proud of uh, our partners. Uh, this has been one of those things that people can point to as a huge success story about how we can come together as a community and partner and actually um, share food with each other and share um, you know, experiences and just be a community of growers who care about food insecurity. So I just wanted to at least say, it's been a very wonderful partnership and a model that could be used throughout the country with different types of people in different areas to really feed people. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of, uh, you know, our, our work and, and working with NOFA and our growers that it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to show people still coming together around the food systems. Absolutely. Yeah, so some of our growers, um, part of being part of the project is um, letting us know how it's going and giving updates and sharing photos and whatnot. So just sharing a few here. I know Allison will talk about their experience, um, but here's on the other, completely on the other side of the state, um, the South Hero Land Trust and how they've integrated it into some of their programs and education. Yeah, I also wanna to say too that, I mean, this isn't just segregated to Vermont. I mean, we are starting to work, we have a thing called the Abenaki Trails Project in New Hampshire that works with different towns and communities on not only showing historical locations, but also uh, we have that food shelf area down in Conococke, and we are working with different local farmers and growers there to do the same thing we do in Vermont. So this thing has started to expand into our other areas because most people don't realize the Abenaki territory goes from upper Massachusetts all the way up into Canada, all across New Hampshire over to Moosehead Lake in Maine. So Nelhegan, our tribe is one of the largest uh, Abenaki tribes in the United States. Um, you know, we, you know, we have citizens in all of those territories, including New Hampshire. So we are not a Vermont tribe, Abenaki tribe. We are a tribe who happens to be recognized by Vermont. It's a different because we don't really realize European boundaries, right? Our citizens are everywhere. So I just want, I really appreciate the, the Upper Valley Land Trust having us give this talk because we are also rooted deeply in New Hampshire as well as Vermont. So it, it pertains to your area or in the area of New Hampshire where people live. So we would love to expand these programs into our, our um, territorial areas of New Hampshire and beyond. Right. I know you mentioned the Harvest Festival that we had as a celebration um, in September, do you wanna? Sure, sure. Part of the uh, Harvest Festival, every year we would come together, like I said, um, when people, can you still hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, every year we would come together, uh, we were nomadic people come together and share our foods. Uh, we would also um, come together to do different activities and hold meetings and stuff. So the Harvest Festival at the end of the year is a natural uh, event that Native people would have. And we have done this together and invited our partners in our community. So we came together, I think it was around September 25th or 23rd area uh, at BYCC in Richmond. And we held, we invited other tribes 
to come. We, we had uh, demonstrations of what we grew, um, where we stored things, where we, how we ground food, things in the corn and the uh, cornmeal, uh, the different beans that we had. People had a real hands-on experience. We told our, our, our corn mother stories. We did our songs. Uh, you know, as you can see here on Mumbaiwi uh, is a uh, educational area uh, or nonprofit that also was participating along with our Nalhegan citizens who were doing some of the songs and some of the, uh, some of the, uh, what the harvest dance was. Cause we have, see part of the green corn ceremony is the song that we sing, uh, you know, goes, you gotta go away, you gotta go away, oh, you go away. And it does this a bunch and it goes, oh, la, the quay, quay, hi, hi, one day. Then when the, when the corn's ready, it goes, yane, ho, yane, yane, ho, yane, ho, yane, hane, ho, yane, ho, yane. And as the victory, you're ready to eat. So there's the song, there's a story, and then there's the dance. So it's a whole, it's a whole ceremony of, of celebrating the harvest. And so that's what we did here, um, and, and the public got to see that, and they got to witness and participate in that. And then we had Joe Boston cook some food uh, from, the, from the garden crops, and like I said, VYCC was great, and NOFA coordinated everything, so it was really wonderful. Yeah, and just in case folks aren't familiar, VYCC is the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. They have this beautiful site in Richmond. Yep, yeah, yeah, and... Like I said, we, we have land, we have access to, to gather natural foods, medicines, and artist material on their lands as well. One of the things we do as part of that partnership, like I said, we, we also get access to, to natural foods and medicines. So, um, but yeah, uh, I just think that it's a wonderful thing. I think it can be expanded. Um, I'm glad that we can bring this to you. And it's just, like I said, it's a huge success story in food security. And uh, yeah, here's some of the processing that we did at Joe Boston's, uh, the Vermont Bean Company. Uh, that's a bean thresher on the left. Uh, the modern technology is wonderful. Uh, you know, we like to do things that are easy if it makes our life easier too, just like our ancestors. So we had a, the, on the left, it's a, it's, a, it's a bean shucker that you throw your beans in and it would, it would kind of take it out of it, separate it from the pods. And, and then on the right is a corn shucker uh, it's a wonderful machine. It's a, it's a, if you, if you have corn at all and you like to dry it, 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 it you put the corn cob in one side, it spits out the cob and it, and it separates the, the kernels from the cob. It's very inexpensive. It's, it's called the cyclone. It's really wonderful. And then it, it sure beats trying to twist the corn off with your hands uh, or by a hand crank. It's just a, it's just a wonderful tool. And it's not that expensive that they use a lot of it out West when they're doing feed for animals and stuff. Um, but we, we put them in the buckets and then we, we would grind up the corn and then you could use the cobs for smoking uh, meats or, or making doll corn husk dolls or other type things when you had the husks. You could use the materials that, you, that were considered waste uh, to other people, but we could use them for other things. Go ahead, Zia, if you want to advance it. Squash processing. Yep, squash processing. You were back right there. This is the thousands of pounds and hundreds and you know thousands of pounds of squash that we processed by hand uh, we had a bunch of volunteers it was wonderful one thing with a big lesson learned is to wear knife gloves <laughs> I almost sliced my finger off and so you know it's like oh better get some gloves uh, lessons learned uh, but you know when you're spending a long time we had uh, I think we had a total of four days didn't we Zia it was over two weekends uh and, and we processed a lot of squash during that period. And if it, to put it in context, if you, uh, if you don't know, if you deal a lot in bulk, a Gaylord, we had about six pallets with six Gaylords, which are probably like a four by four foot, um, uh, almost like a cord of, of wood, you know, like it's a four by four by four or whatever. I don't know exactly the size, like container filled with squash. So we had six of those. And it, so that took up a lot of room and, and we, we compiled it down into about two pallets uh, of actual processed squash. And if you see on the right, uh, after we, after we sliced them and de-seeded them, we kept the seeds for, we kept some of the seeds that look like the most pure because some of these cross contaminated, you know, with, when farmers are growing them, they cross pollinate. And so some of them are our original seeds. So we try to keep some that looked as pure 
to the original as we could to save them off as a seed bank. And then we, we would slight, we would have some people deseeding and then we would put them in a big pro food processor that cut them in cubes. And then somebody would then go to the right hand, you know, the right hand side and we would, um, we would process them and vacuum pack them and then put them in the freezer. So uh, we, we work with the Vermont Commercial Warehouse in, in Williston um, to freeze some of our, our products. And we have different places throughout the state, but we had, uh, we had two pallets full of the processed squash. And part of this, since we had such an abundance, we're gonna be helping the Vermont Food Bank. They're interested because they're, they're always short of good wholesome food. So not only are we gonna provide what we need for ourselves, but we're also gonna get to share that with other Vermonters around the state um, because of the food bank. Yeah, you just touched on seed saving, so here's some images. Yeah, we had a lot of seeds. Probably we kept about a five-gallon bucket full of Algonquin squash seeds, and we probably have about a five-gallon bucket full of uh, of the uh, of the beans, you know, to redistribute um, tobacco seeds. Uh, I still have some. We, you know, <clears throat> one thing about the corn and tobacco story, Grant, the mothers, is that our natural fence barriers were the tobacco. So part of our story is we would, we would line our gardens with tobacco because we use tobacco for ceremony. Uh, but also it is a, a very sticky kind of plant. It, it, it weeps um, the nicotine um, the sap. On, so if bugs come to it, they stick to it. And then animals don't like to eat it because of the nicotine. So it's like a natural fence. So it keeps a lot of critters out. And a lot of our crops are built to withstand uh, critters or, or infestation. We have some squash that are so hard, you need an ax to break them, or you have to, you have to throw them on a concrete thing to break them in half because they, they're so tough. So a critter would get tired of chewing before they would get into it. Um, so we, you know, some of these are very unique. And like I said, we, uh, we're different, we're trying different techniques and different things to honor the ancient past while bringing it into the future. So it's kind of a combination of, traditional growing and seed saving and food and then production that we can use to feed people that are not always the same. And that's some of the cornmeal. Uh, we bought a cornmeal, I uh, bought a cornmeal about a year ago and just to process all of it so we could package and store the corn and the cornmeal and distribute that out. Uh, we'd love to get enough someday to create a product so it helps sustain our programs because we live off grants and donations. We don't have a renewable resource or funding to help um, keep this program going. So we rely on grants and donations and the generosity of farmers to help us. So if we can get a product someday that the proceeds could go to help pay for the storage costs, the distribution costs, the labor involved, and you know that would be a wonderful thing because you never know when grants or donations are not going to be there. So, um, you know, but, but we have to store anyway for our people. So we package it up and, and, and be able to store it and distribute it in packages, like one pound pack packages of cornmeal and beans. Yeah. Yeah. And we can attest that the um, cornbread is absolutely delicious made from yeah. the freshly ground <laughs> corn. Oh, it's wonderful. And then you just, you, you got to sift it a little bit unless you really like the outer hull. But I do want to tell people that uh, as a kind of a closing note on, on what I've been talking about is that if you really think about New England, it's going to be very, very important moving forward with climate change. I mean, out west is a fire season. They don't have a summer season anymore. It's fire season, which destroys crops. Lake Mead is drying up in the Midwest. They have a hard time even get hay for their cows now, not, not even talking about growing food. So New England is going to start being more and more reliant upon growing food for the nation. And I think, um, you know, our, some of what we're doing is a model to help do it in a community and not just big, large commercial areas to grow food. I think this is a community effort and a community model where everybody shares. And I also think there's a way of expanding this into other areas that would just give the native knowledge of ancient traditions into modern everyday growing. So we have the scientific people who know uh, the scientific area and we have the historical knowledge that it's a wonderful thing. And, and if we can develop food sources that could meet the demands of climate change, 
you know, like our Kawasak corn grows in 60, 65 days. So even if spring is comes really late or the frost comes early or whatever, we could grow, uh, we could still be guaranteed a crop of, of food or even if at the other extremes where it becomes an extended season, so our products are pretty drought, drought tolerant, um, you know, over because they've had to deal with Vermont climate for thousands of years. So uh, I do think that there is some value in trying to develop food systems that will be um, resistant or at least resilient within climate change. I mean, you're never going to get everything perfect, but I think we should continue to uh, work toward this because we're going to be, like I said, more and more people are going to be either flocking to New England or rely on us for food. And um, I think we're going to be at the forefront, all of us as growers are going to be at the forefront of this movement. Um, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Allison, do you want to pause for some questions or you want to jump in with um, how your year went? Um, I'll talk really briefly. So let's just uh, get through what I have to say and we'll get to the questions after. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And go. Does that look all right to everybody? Let's see. Yep, that looks great. All right. So um, at the Upper Valley Land Trust, a few years ago, we started a food pantry garden program at Brookmead Conservation Area, which is in Norwich, Vermont. And um, last year, we began partnering with the Abenaki Land Link program at that site. So I'm going to talk really briefly about the whole garden program and then about the Abenaki Land Link program, just in case anyone on this call is interested in um, seeing what we're doing or volunteering with us. Um, so Brookmead Conservation Area is in Norwich. It's on Turnpike Road. It's 350 acres of fields and forests with five miles of recreational trails. It is one of our most popular uh, conservation areas. And um, it's very, uh, <laughs> well frequented and it's very easily accessible. So it was a great location for us to start our food pantry garden program. It also has been uh, historically a farm and the land where we first started the garden, uh, believe it or not, had no rocks in it. It was amazing um, because it had been so, it had been you know tilled and farmed for generations. Um, our food pantry garden program, it began in 2019 with just a quarter of an acre at Brookmead where we planted mostly potatoes. Um, it started in partnership with Willing Hands. Uh, they're a nonprofit organization that takes food waste, um, either from farms or from uh, stores like the co-op and distributes it to food banks, uh, homeless shelters, and other places where people who are food insecure can go to get food. As I said, we grew 900 pounds of vegetables in their first year. We expanded in 2020 um, due to the increased food insecurity because of the pandemic. And then we expanded again in 2021 to a second location in Charlestown, New Hampshire. Um, and then in 2021, we became involved with the Abenaki Land Link Program. So this has, there's been rapid expansion of this program um, from a small quarter of an acre potato plot to what is now 1.17 acres of a variety of different foods going to a variety of different sources. So it's been a super successful program and it is my baby and I love it. Um, this is a picture. I tried to find one picture that would show you how uh, big our Brookmead garden is, but it's really hard to show. So this is the main plot. Um, these folks out there are harvesting spinach um, and it has been just a great project for us. So our Abenaki Land Link plot, that is if you've ever been to Brookmead, it is right by the trailhead. Um, it's very prominently located. It has, this is a picture of the sign that is right by the garden. Um, it's a 50 by 50 foot plot um, that I hope to someday completely fill with Abenaki land link crops. Um, last year, it was, I think, just two rows of, we planted the three different kinds of beans and the Algonquin squash. Um, this year, I'm hoping to also plant corn um, and to plant more of everything. Um, yeah, we planted about 100 feet with Abenaki crops. I already said all that. So that's a picture. Um, it's mostly potatoes. And then you can see where the green stakes are, are the pole beans. And then beyond that, you can't really see them, but there's 
squash back there. And we only planted, I think, five um, squash plants, and we ended up with 70 pounds of squash. So uh, as Chief Stevens said, it was an incredible year uh, for all types of squashes, but definitely for our Algonquin squash. Um, this is a more close up picture. This is me trying to gauge how big this squash was going to get um, and when it would be ripe. This, I mean, it's not something that I had grown before. So I was looking at this, what looked like a giant zucchini and going, is this right? <laughs> um, they were left for a lot longer and they were bigger and orange when they were harvested. Um, as you can see in the right picture there, those are two of, I think, our three bins of squash and some of our um, beans. And I would say uh, going forward in this program, what I really <laughs> need is a storage area for some of these things. Um, keeping these beans on my porch in these boxes um, was not great for them because we had that frost um, that sort of killed the plants and then left these beans a little bit on the wet side. So I think some of them didn't make it all the way <laughs> to uh, where they were going. But um, that is my sort of takeaway is this year I need to figure out a storage situation for some of these crops. So we had a pretty successful first year. As I said, we uh, harvested 70 pounds of Algonquin squash, six pounds of skunk beans, two of Mohawk and four of true cranberry. Um, and for the land trust, I will say the reason we started the, the food pantry garden program in the first place is that um, the Upper Valley Land Trust owns a fair amount of land in the Upper Valley. And a lot of it is used um, for recreation, which is great. Um, recreation is an important thing, getting outside, enjoying nature, very important. But we also wanted to use our land for what we like to say, the good of the whole community. So for people who you know, recreating isn't important or they're unable to recreate. People who are suffering from economic, social um, injustices and food insecurity, you know, recreation is probably not at the top of their list of things um, that are important to them. And so we thought with the amount of land that we have and how much of it is um, useful for agriculture that we could be growing food for people who need it. So our food pantry garden program started um, with that in mind, and we were really happy to be able to partner with the Abenaki Land Link Program to do sort of a similar thing of using our land to provide, to, to grow indigenous seeds and then provide that food back to the Milhegan tribe has been um, really great. I, I've really enjoyed it. I've learned a ton um, just through uh, growing the foods and learning how to grow the foods. And also um, going to the Harvest Festival was very um, interesting and I learned a lot from it. So um, those are the main takeaways I would say from our experience and I'm really looking forward to next year. Um, so that is my very short presentation on what our garden experience is like, though I'm happy to answer any questions about the Abenaki Land Link plot or our either of our other gardens um, at Brookmead and in Charleston. So with that, let's get to some questions. Um, all right, we have quite a few. So the first one comes from Rebecca. who says, great information, thank you. How far away were the traditional wintering and summer grounds? Um, our daughter and her family live in Putney on the ridge over a great meadow, a floodplain. She's been told that there were food caches in the cliffs on the ridge which, in which she lives. Have you heard of this site as a summer grounds? Um, if we discovered a cache, who would we talk? Who would we contact? Yes, I can answer that. Um, we had, um, as you know, before Europeans were here, I think there was like 1.4 million native people in the United States, or over a million. Um, and then, <clears throat> obviously, disease and war and other displacement wiped a lot of us out. So we had we had family bands along every river stretch of river. Uh, lake, pond, those, that's the areas that we would grow our foods because when the floods left, they left fertile soil and it was easier to turn over and mound up. And, and that's, that was, and we could get access to sucker fish that would be used for fertilizer and, and so on and so forth. Those would be our, our summer ground. So anywhere close to waterways would be our, um, would be our 
um, growing areas. And then we would store them in places that like caves or we would bury them or we would create stone structures that we could put them in so animals couldn't get to them. Uh, so <clears throat> I don't know specifically where you're talking about. If you find it, just get a hold of me. Uh, and just to clarify, when we, we keep saying this, this is a Nalhegan Abenaki tribe project. Each tribe is sovereign, have their own government. So we're not all the same. I mean, we're Abenaki people, but each tribe is different. This Abenaki land link project is specifically to Abenaki for Nalhegan Abenaki. However, we use the produce to feed other tribes who request it, like El Nu or, or Masiskoi or anybody else who might ask for it. So I just wanted to at least answer that um, question. So that way, when you talk about these programs, you know it's specifically to Nalhegan. If you were talking to other people, they wouldn't know what you're talking about when it comes to the specifics. So um, I hope that answers your question about the food caches. They would always be around waterways, and then we would move into the pines, why we're called Kohasuk means pine. We would move into our winter grounds so we could hunt big animals and allow the, 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 the air, other areas to replenish. So we would switch between our wintering grounds, which are in the woods and in the pines, where the snow is less, and our summer and ground. So each time those populations could replenish. Um, so, cause you don't want to stay in one place all the time cause it uses up all your food, right? So, uh, and we did agroforestry and we groomed the forest so that way it'd be conducive for those animals. So that way it would be a consistent food source. Great. I don't know if that answers your question, but. I, uh, I think it does. Um, okay, so this next question is from Loretta. Um, you already kind of answered this when you were talking about tobacco, but just in case you want to say anything else about it, she was asking about what type of companion plantings um, do or did the Abenaki use to deter insects, deers, bears, etc. Yeah, like I said, the tobacco was the main deterrent. Uh, like I said, because of the nicotine, animals didn't like to eat the leaves because, I mean, it's like when you handle tobacco, if you've never done it, it's like, if you don't wear some sort of gloves or something, it's like having 10 nicoderm patches on your arm. I mean, you'll get lightheaded woozy because that nicotine gets absorbed into your skin. So we know that our people would have put something on their hand that would create a barrier, um, you know, for the, so it couldn't be absorbed, whether it be mud, whether it be, uh, you know, leather or something to be able to gather these plants. Um, so animals don't like to eat it. So it's like a, a barrier. Uh, and like I said, the, the bugs get attached when they come to the flowers, because they're beautiful flowers. They're yellow or for, the, for our native tobacco here, we call it rabbit tobacco or ear, it's also known as Iroquois tobacco, but it's a yellow bell flower. The other stuff that was brought up from Plymouth Plantation and other areas from the Europeans in the South was more of the big burly type ones with the, the white and pink flowers. And they grow like four to six feet high where ours grow small. So those would be, we would use both. So those would be used as natural barriers, like I said, and, and that would, and, and not only that, but our crops also had a, had evolved to be a deterrent. Like I was telling you about that gourd kind of squash type thing that you have to literally take an ax or a hammer to break it open because the shell is so hard that it would, it takes a lot of chewing to get, you know, for a rodent to try to, to, to do it. They, they would have to chew the vine to, to cut off the nutrients and then hopefully it would rot so they could get into it because it's very hard. So some of our, our crops are very conducent or like the skunk beans, they're so prolific, you're gonna get something out of them because even if, you, if they take 10 or 20%, you still have a lot more beans that you can, that you can harvest. So it's, it's kind of a combination between that, the natural barrier and the, 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 the crops kind of developing their own defense mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't use like the marigolds, like what Europeans, they put marigolds in the garden and other types. Um, there could be other things that would, critters don't like, but I know tobacco was our major fencing, if you want natural fencing. Um, this next question maybe is for Zia. Um, Rebecca wants to know if she, as a gardener, can participate in the project. Um, maybe you want to give an overview of how people can do that? <laughs> sure. Um, we're having people sign up right now, and I'm happy to send you out some information if you want to contact me. Um, right, like I said earlier, we there's been a whole range of folks that participate, whether you might just be planting five plants of something or um, all the way up to commercial farms. So, yes, 
I'm happy to provide info. Yeah, the only caveat I'll add to that is since these are indigenous crops, we ask that people sign a, a, a memorandum of understanding that they, if they, if they provide, if they grow crops for us, they can use the, some of the crops for their own family. We just ask that they don't use them for farmers markets or they don't, um, they don't uh, give the seed, that the seeds come back to us because we've had a lot of things over the years taken from us and these are our indigenous seeds. So once, uh, you know, some of our stuff is desirable. So when you give it to others, we have no control over it. And then it becomes, we've had that happen with our callous flint corns. Some of the other Abenaki rose corn is now commercial. Uh, true cranberry beans are now commercial. There are, so we ask that people just respect that they keep enough seeds to grow for themselves. If they do share it with a, like they do share it with someone that they remove the seeds and keep the seeds or, you know, or return the seeds back to us. So that's, that's kind of a caveat that we ask if people participate. Great. Um, and this is the last question, unless anyone else wants to type something in. Um, and I'm going to apologize for my pronunciations of these words. Um, I am interested in learning how the Nalhegan band intersects with the Kohasek traditional band of the sovereign Abenaki nation. The Kohasek band will have a powwow on June 11th and 12th in Ackworth, New Hampshire. Will the Nalhegan band participate in this community celebration? I don't know, um, since they are their own tribe and they have their own events. Uh, if we are invited to it or if it's open, then some of our citizens may come. I don't know exactly. We have to check our calendars as for those things. I mean, we don't, we try to keep good relations as if we can with all of the tribes. I mean, because we're so few, right? So we have to try to keep good relations. But, um, and we do have citizens in New Hampshire and we do work with other tribes. So I can't say that we will or we won't. I mean, we're, there's nothing saying we won't, um, but we have to check our schedules and who's available and if we're invited, because we don't like to go to other places and assume that we're invited on, unless we are, right? That's, that's like going to somebody's house and not sure if you're, it's okay. <laughs> you know, that, it, you know, so, um, you know, some tribes work well together, others don't. There's still tribal politics like there is in the United States politics and government. Um, so it just depends on, on how that plays out. So it's not naive that we're all, um, we all play good in the sandbox, but we do our best to uh, work with all who are, work with who work with us and support those um, who are holding events. We just held events down in Mount Kearsage. We did the snow state games at Mount Kearsage Museum and and like I said, we have our Abenaki Trails projects down there. So we have to we have to see what this is about or what the powwow is and which Kowasuk band is putting it on. And because there's a few Kowasuk bands. Um, but I mean there's nothing precluding us from doing that. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions and we're basically at time. So I want to say thank you, Zia and Chief Stevens for joining us today. I think this was a really great overview of the program that hopefully will get more people interested. Um, so this, this talk will be on the UVLT YouTube um, channel if anybody wants to share it um, with friends. And I will also get you guys the links for that. Um, and uh, our next Lunch and Learn will be in April. It is about the life cycles of monarch butterflies and butterfly conservation, in case anyone's interested in that. So uh, again, thank you everyone for coming. Yep. This was great. I will, I will say goodbye in our language. It's adio, goodbye, right? Uh, Nana walmazi, that means take care until I see you again. And Oli Bumkani, that means travel well or paddle well. So adio, Nana walmazi, Oli Bumkani. So. Thank you all. Great to be with you today. Bye. Bye.